but essentially we wanted to see if we could get boys to engage in cross-gender play and what design elements we might use to encourage and facilitate uh, that process. All right, to help set the sociocultural context for this work, uh, I want to talk about a few headline-grabbing incidents that have emerged in the United States in the past several years. Uh, the first of which is the seemingly innocuous ad for clothing retailer J. Crew that depicts its creative director uh, caught in a candid moment with her son. Uh, but this seemingly simple ad uh, triggered a firestorm. It became viral instantly and triggered a lot of furor and heated discussion in the blogosphere and Twittersphere for one very simple reason, the fact that she is shown painting her son's, her son's toenails pink. And in fact, there are a lot of commentary uh, that emerged about this incident, suggesting that behaviors like this challenge uh, traditional notions of gender, and essentially that somehow by painting her son's toenails pink, she was somehow threatening his future masculinity. In the past several years, there have been a number of well-publicized incidents that sort of reinforced that there are these strict gender norms in place in the United States. Uh, cases where boys are banned from school or suspended for doing things like having a My Little Pony backpack or wearing dresses to school or wearing makeup. And just last year, there was a report on CNN suggesting that there are these harsher sanctions for boys to engage in cross-gender play. And in fact, this is worn out in the literature on gender roles and sex norms. The fact that there are harsher sanctions and harsher punishments uh, for boys compared to girls for violating what are perceived to be appropriate behaviors uh, for their gender identity. And in fact, this pressure to conform extends even to social play situations. And in fact, those conformity pressures might be the most keenly felt uh, in social play. At the same time, however, the literature from psychology suggests there are distinct benefits to engaging in cross-gender play for boys and for girls. Uh, so for example, engaging in cross-gender role play encourages a higher level of psychological androgyny, the idea of seeing yourself as embodying both masculine and feminine traits, uh, which other psychologists have associated with benefits such as increased in interpersonal flexibility, creativity, and perspective taking. In addition, as my work has shown and others, have, others' work have shown, this idea of cross-gender role play can also be the avenue toward reducing gender stereotyping and encourage a more positive, inclusive attitude uh, toward other groups. So our key question that we sought to tackle with this work is, could we actually orchestrate a play situation that would facilitate cross-gender role play for boys, and as a result, affect their perceptions of themselves and perhaps their perceptions of gender norms and roles as well? To do this, we used the strategy board game Monarch, uh, designed by my co-author Mary Flanagan and her collaborators Max Seidman and Zara Downs. This game is noteworthy because it's one of the few commercial board games that features all female protagonists. So in the game, players are cast as the role of a competing sibling princess. Uh, and it's essentially a tableau builder. It's a card game where you're trying to amass the best sort of collection of court cards uh, that synergize with each other to give you the maximum uh, crown points which represent your power in the game. Uh, so for purposes of the research, the game itself is somewhat incidental uh, because we simply focused on varying different aspects of the way we presented uh, the character to players. But I'm happy to talk more uh, about the game if you're interested during the Q&A. So when this game was on Kickstarter, it was a, it was a su successful Kickstarter campaign a few years ago, uh, we saw that there was actually heated discussion about this idea of having all women protagonists in the game, uh, sort of echoing some of the headlines I presented earlier. So one Redditor uh, questioned the fact that we had all women uh, protagonists uh, and the fact that we might be turning off a substantial portion of the board game playing community, which is at that time was lar largely dominated by men. Uh, in addition, when shopping this game around to potential publishers, Mary faced the same resistance. Most publishers basically required her to change at least one of the characters to be male in order for them to even consider publishing the game, which is why ultimately she went the route of using Kickstarter to self-fund the game instead. So in the research that we conducted, we varied two key aspects of the way the character was presented to players. And in the studies we'll present, these are all male players. Uh, one, we varied the timing of the revelation of players' princess roles. We either revealed that early, when players started playing the game, or through a delayed reveal about one-third of the way through the game. And second, in another study, we looked at varying the stereotypicality of a depicted image of the princess character, uh, comparing a, a highly stereotypically feminine image versus a less stereotypically feminine image. 
This work is based on some of my prior research on a phenomenon that my colleagues and I call experience taking, which is this idea of psychologically merging with a character in a fictional world, that even embodying the mindset and persona of that character. And the work that I've done prior to this showed that experience taking can lead readers, or in some cases players, to internalize the traits of a character that they identify with. And importantly, some of the work that we've done so provided the direct inspiration for the variables that we manipulated in our research. One, uh, when you're dealing with uh, characters in a narrative who belong to a social outgroup, for example, another race or sexual orientation, uh, we found that delaying the revelation of that outgroup membership was effective at encouraging a higher level of experience taking. And likewise, if we establish different bases of similarity, uh, shared experiences, share other shared identity memberships between the reader and the character, that was enough to sort of offset the potential off-putting nature of an outgroup membership. In addition, we situate this work within a broader framework of design that Mary Flanagan, Max Simon, and I have developed over the past several years, which we call the Embedded Design Approach for designing transformational games. This basic approach uses a variety of strategies to find ways of presenting persuasive content or persuasive messaging in a game in a way that's, that's more stealthy, that relies on some level of, of interweaving or concealing the message. And specifically, delayed revelation of an outgroup membership represents a strategy of obfuscation, somehow concealing the persuasive intent of a game until, or, or a narrative until some point in the experience. And the idea of having some combination of dissimilar and similar elements uh, represents an example of intermixing, the idea of combining potentially off-putting content with content that's much more familiar and approachable. So in general, by varying these different aspects of the way we presented the character, uh, we wanted to see if we could affect the way that players received the game as well as how they responded to it afterward. So in our first study, we looked at this effect of delayed revelation. So again, we had all male play groups be randomly assigned to one of two experimental conditions, either the early reveal or delayed reveal conditions. And afterward, we measured a number of uh, responses, including per perceptions of the game itself, uh, levels of experience taking, which we use at the established scale that I developed in my prior research, as well as a measure, a new measure we developed to, to assess gender norm acceptance. Uh, so I'll go over this in brief, but I can talk much more about this in the Q&A, but we essentially created an, a scale where uh, participants were given a ten, uh, 10 sentences, which they were told were the first line in a short story that had a character with a gender ambiguous name engaging either in masculine, feminine, or neutral behaviors. And it was up to the participants to come up with a second line in the story. And we used the pronouns they use as indication of the gender they were assigning to that character. So here are the, some of the highlights from the results. So we found that the delayed revelation of, of the princess role for the boys led them to believe that the game was more rewarding and also equally appropriate for boys and girls compared to the early reveal condition. We also see a significantly higher level of experience taking that resulted from delayed revelation. And interestingly, we found that in a delayed reveal condition that a significantly higher proportion of participants assigned he or him pronouns to the more feminine sentences, sentences where a character was engaging in feminine behaviors like showing emotion or being nurturing or caring toward others. In our second study, we used roughly the same methodology, but this time we varied whether or not uh, character, or the character depiction itself was more or less stereotypical. In this case, all boys knew they were princesses going into the game, but we varied the depiction of the character art, uh, like this image shows here. So we pre-tested these images to show uh, that they were established to be higher versus lower in stereotypicality. And we included the same measures of evaluations and experience taking, and this time included a measure of self-rated femininity and masculinity using BEM's sex role inventory, uh, basically to see if boys' own self-perceptions might change as a result of embodying their princess role. So here we found that using the less stereotypical art uh, led players to be more likely to say they would play the game again. And again, they were more likely to say the game was equally appropriate for boys and girls. Once again, experience taking levels were significantly higher with the less stereotypical depiction. So again, boys were more likely to embody their role if they were given the less stereotypical image versus the more stereotypical one. And on both ratings of femininity and masculinity, so self-ascribed masculinity and femininity, uh, the, the less stereotypical depiction led to increased ratings. So in other words, boys were more likely to see themselves as more psychologically androgynous as a result of embodying their female role to a greater extent. 
So to sum up, this work suggests that these tactics of delayed revelation or somehow intermixing elements of a character that might be more distancing with ones that are more familiar and approachable, so in this case, identity group memberships that are partially shared and partially distinct, could be a stepping stone toward creating a greater psychological connection with a character who belongs to an outgroup, in this case, uh, for boys, embodying a female protagonist role. In future work, we want to see if these results will hold over time. We measured the immediate effect of these variables. We wanted to see if there's any, any sort of sustained effect, if the experience of embodying their character might actually then carry over to, to affect the way boys approach future play situations, as well as to look at how different factors of the group itself, so for example, apparent norms that emerge in a group, might affect the way that, uh, that, that players respond to these different design prompts or design elements. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Adrian Schneider from Queen's University. I wanted to ask, how was the delayed reveal of of the princess actually done? Was it like, yeah. hey, guess what? This whole time you've been a prince. I'm guessing not, but right. <laughs> well, I actually was not so far away from that. Uh, so. <laughs> In that condition, we told boys at the beginning that they were playing siblings. Uh, and in the game, I didn't describe the contents in, in very much detail, but there are, there's an, a stack of event cards that are used. And so in, in this, both studies, we try to keep the, the material of the game as constant as possible. Uh, and so we had a sequence of event cards that was the same for every play group. In the delayed reveal condition, one of the cards revealed to the entire group uh, that they were playing princesses. It was sort of incidentally mentioned on the card, but it was placed in the stack so we knew that the boys would get it about a third of the way through the game. And, and interestingly, during playtesting, we tried out this procedure to see what was happening from, from our perspective, and it seemed like we were a little bit worried. When we saw boys go through this procedure uh, in our piloting, they seemed to be sort of... Uh, they seemed, to, this, they seemed to find that off-putting to find that revelation, but we weren't sure what was happening internally. So I think it took them sort of a moment to process it, the, the subversion of their expectations. Uh, but based on my prior work, we, we think what was happening is that they had formed a strong connection with their character to that point in the game, that they had this sort of level, maybe a level of cognitive dissonance that they, that they resolved by basically accepting that fact about the character. And my prior work with written narratives showed, has shown that's basically the process that happens. There might be a momentary break in your immersion to sort of process this surprising fact about the character, but you have this motivation to maintain this connection because you'd already established it up to that point. Uh, so that was how we handled it. We used this sort of pre-stacked uh, pre event deck to make that revelation happen at the same time for every play group. Whereas in the early reveal, we just told them at the beginning when we described the game that they were princesses rather than just siblings. Thanks for the question. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I have one more question while the next speaker set up. Hello, Gabriela Tisa from Eindhoven University. Uh, I saw that you did this uh, study with um, young teenagers, so children between 10 or 12 and 15. So do you think that age has an effect on your results or could have been an effect on your results? Yeah, that's a great question. There is some work suggesting that sort of the rigidity of gender norms sort of increases over time. So with younger children, there's much more flexibility and often a, a slightly higher level of forgiveness for violating those norms. So I think that by adolescence, that's where those pressures to conform sort of really start to kick in. Um, so I think, if anything, the, we, it would require less of a barrier to get younger children to sort of enter into cross-gender uh, cross role play. And, and we, we basically set ourselves up in a situation where we thought it would be difficult to get effects. Uh, we knew we were dealing with a group where there were high social pressures to conform. Uh, we were dealing with all-boy play groups. In some cases, we went to all-boy schools where these pressures to conform sort of perpetuate on a daily basis. So we basically set our, our challenge level high to be able to see if these design elements could be strong enough to overcome those psychological barriers. But I definitely think there are variations uh, over the developmental period about how rigid those norms are, which would affect what strategies would you, would, you would need to use to basically encourage that type of, of, of play of, or cross-gender experimentation. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Michael Ahmadi 